I wish actors knew. Sound edition. Everyone, I'm Matthew Cornwell with Get Taped here in Atlanta, Georgia, one of Atlanta's original audition taping services, which I co in with my amazingly talented, beautiful wife and best friend, Brooke. This video is part of our interview series titled, I Wish Actors Knew. And this week, we're talking about sound. sound. For this interview, I was so thankful to sit down with Aaron Siegel, who is a popular sound mixer here in town. Boom. We've run into each other on a bunch of sets over the years, and he's extremely talented at what he does. Be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified when we drop future interviews in this series, as well as our normal weekly videos. It also helps us a ton to share our videos with your fellow actors or anyone else you think might benefit from this material. Oh, and before we jump into the interview, I feel compelled to let you know this was the first interview I recorded in the series. And unfortunately, I didn't have a crew. Yeah. And so while I framed up Aaron perfectly, my attempts to frame myself, let's just say fell short. So I'm sort of cut off at the forehead right about where the brim of my hat is for the entirety of this hour long interview. And I didn't realize it till after the fact which meant that it was a little too difficult to go back and fix it. So forgive the errant framing of me, but after all, I am not the subject of this interview, so it doesn't matter. So with that in mind, enjoy. Well, uh, welcome, Aaron, to uh, this uh, uh, interview. I'm so thankful to have you specifically here to talk about sound and how sound relates to actors, because I do think it is one of the, the perhaps the most misunderstood discipline that is on a set. But before we sort of get into the nitty gritty of that, uh, why don't you just share uh, some of your history in the industry, what maybe brought you to the industry, and so forth? Well, let's, uh, let's go back to when I wanted to go to college. I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to get a degree in film, in filmmaking. And uh, when I was at UGA, they didn't have a film major at the time. So I said, well, we can, you know, put classes together for you. And I agreed to do that for a little while. And then they tried to stick me in news writing. And I said, what does news writing have to do with filmmaking? So I moved back to Atlanta, went to Georgia State, got my degree in um a Bachelor of Science in Music Production and Music Business. And I was producing music for a while for local artists and some national artists. And then um, I got a call from a mixer that had just moved to town, and he was trying to get a boom operator for a commercial in Alabama. And I said, well, I've never done that before. He says, look, you know, I see that you've got a degree in audio production. This is just advanced mic placement. And then I went with him to Birmingham, Alabama for three days to do this commercial. It was for Ballpark Franks. Michael Jordan was the uh, a talent because he was playing baseball at the time. That's how long ago it was. And I boomed on and off for like five or six years for different uh, mixers in town. Eventually, um, one of the people I'd worked with on set gave me a call and said, hey, look, we've burned all our favors with all of the mixers in town. We've got this low-budget, campy horror movie, and we need a mixer to finish out the last two weeks of the show. You know, consider this a promotion. So I uh, ended up mixing the last two weeks of a campy horror movie. It's called The Greenskeeper. And then um, that movie came out, and I started mixing, and I've been mixing ever since. I boomed occasionally for other mixers. And somewhere in, in that uh, time frame, uh, especially early 2000s, was probably the first time we got a chance to, to be on the same set together. Yes, it's the, it's the um, desire to work and work on everything that comes your way when you first start out, you know. So let's sort of get into the, the crux of, of this interview, which is trying to bridge the gap um, of knowledge uh, with, with actors. Can you tell the difference between, let's say, a, a new actor first time on a maybe any set, but maybe certainly on a full budget set versus a veteran actor who's not necessarily a, a celebrity, but just someone that when they walk up to you, uh, to the over to the cart to get mic'd up that first time that you can kind of just tell a green actor from a veteran actor. Anybody, any crew member that's been on set for a while can tell anybody that hasn't had any experience on the first day, even though they behave, they're trying to behave like they have experience. 
it's more about what they're not doing as opposed to what they are doing. So a lot of times, yes, we can tell a very green actor or a green actor from somebody that's a veteran. And there's just certain phrases that they use or certain phrases that they don't use. Uh, let's start with that, right? The, the, the actor, especially if they're green, and uh, they get uh, a note from either a, a second AD or a PA saying, hey, uh, Aaron needs to see you over at sound. I'm going to go back a little bit further sure. than walking up to my, my cart because they're going to be in a private rehearsal with a director on set, and that usually involves them running through the lines with the other actors in the scene. Then they're going to open it up to the crew for a blocking rehearsal. And that's when my boom operator is usually going to be on set watching the moves that the actors make. And the boom operator is going to tell me whether or not this person is going to need a wire, a wireless mic, for those of you that are inexperienced with this. But um, so the boom operator is going to make that determination if, if they have one line and it's in unison with everybody else and the boom operator can get it, we're not going to trouble the actor with having to put a wireless mic on them. If they say the word yay or yeah or something like that and the boom operator can get it without having to stretch or uh, get a shadow in the shot or something like that, usually. But it, it's up to my boom operator who's watched the rehearsal and my sound utility, I usually leave it up to them to determine whether or not we're going to do that. Especially when we have minors, we're not going to wire up a minor for one word line if we can get it on the boom. After the uh, blocking rehearsal is done, they will be sent to their dressing rooms to put, be put in costume. And once they're put into costume, then somebody, the first team uh, production assistant, will bring them over to us to get wired. First thing that's important when they come over to us is they need to introduce themselves to us with both their name and their character name. A lot of times, especially green production assistants, will bring them over with their real names. And this presents a problem. Like, let's say there is a character named Matt on a show, and then there's a character named Will. And if they bring you over and they say, this is Matt, we're going to wire you up with Matt's, the character Matt's microphone, and we're going to put you in the scene. Whereas the problem is, is that when the real Matt comes by, you know, um, we're going to be completely confused. So it's very important that as a character, and a lot of actors, especially veteran actors, like to be referred to as their character name because it helps them get into the character themselves. So when they're brought over to us, make sure that they, they say, look, my, my real name is this, but my character is this. So make sure that they identify themselves. And they need to be, be ready to have their privacy invaded, I, su I suppose is just the easiest way to say it. Um, we treat this very professionally, and we make sure that they're comfortable with uh, having a, a wireless mic. This is the mic. And um, to the end of the mic, what we'll do is we'll ask them to fish this end down their pants or their clothing to their ankle, if possible. And then we'll plug it into this transmitter and we'll make sure the transmitter's on. And then we'll take this thing, it's called an RM11. And we'll stick the microphone in here. So you see where the mic is here. And then we'll attach it somewhere here. So this, this is like the general, the best place, the sweet spot for microphone placement, for wireless microphone placement. Then we'll send you on your way. If you have to use the restroom or something like that, come back to us so that we can either disconnect it or make sure that everything's properly done. And uh, we'll have you uh, run a mic check with us before you leave to make sure that the microphone's working properly. And uh, um, one of the things that's very important is when you come to us and we've wired you up and we're testing out your microphone, we ask that you say some of your dialogue, not check one, check two, because that's not what you're going to be saying in the scene. So you, ne you need to deliver some of your dialogue to us and we'll, we'll check it out and then we'll bring the, uh, bring the volume down on the mic and you won't have to worry about it 
you know, until you're done with the day. We will only bring up your mic when you're on set and in the scene. So you do not have to worry about us listening into your conversations because that's taboo. Sure. Because the, the equipment might look trivial to them, yeah. they might be tempted to play with it themselves or turn it off themselves or, or and maybe just speak to that of that desire for only the sound department to touch. Think about it this way. If somebody uh, in the special effects makeup department puts a scar on your face, you're not going to be touching the scar and adjusting it or doing anything with it. you got to think about it as it, it's a piece of gear. It's designed to keep you from having to repeat all of your dialogue later on. It's, and, and the other thing is it's designed as a backup. Wireless mics are like the GoPro of the camera department. Wireless mics are designed to uh, capture the dialogue, but not the performance. The wireless mics are designed so that we can record you in a situation where it's a very, very wide shot. We prefer that the actors request that the close-up shots, their coverage, be uh, captured on the boom. Because the boom microphone has got a, a much larger diaphragm compared to this one. And the boom captures the presence and the performance of the actor versus the wireless mic that just captures the dialogue. Um, it's very important that once we've wired you up, if you have any issues, come back to us and we will try and resolve them for you. But we've had actors that have unplugged their transmitters and the problem is, is that since we do not monitor your conversations, the time that we discover that you've unplugged your transmitter is when you're delivering your dialogue on set and I'm raising the volume and I don't hear anything because we basically, we don't want to listen to your conversations and we, um, we don't monitor you. So, um, I mean, the only thing that we might do is we might... Um, solo you in our headphones just to check to see that the mic hasn't dropped or anything like that before you're ready to perform, like uh, during your rehearsal before you perform. I've been on many a set where uh, I've even jokingly said to an actor when we're sort of at uh, our cast chairs or whatever, I'm like, your, your mic might, you know, might be hot, and then they freak out, like that their mic <laughs> might still be hot while we're just having a normal conversation. Well, it's very important that you, you don't talk trash. And that's just good. Uh, that's just a good piece of advice in general in life, right? Uh, let's say that uh, the role that I'm playing is he's wearing just a, a single layer sleeveless shirt. So you're going to have to go to the skin. Uh, and let's say that it's somebody who has a really hairy chest. Should they worry about that before getting the set or address it with you at the, at the sound cart? They don't need to worry, but just make sure that we are aware of it. Because a lot of times um, we can uh, take steps. I mean, even if you have a hairy chest, we can probably figure it out. We have something called a, a mic strap. It's a strap that it's an elastic strap that straps around your chest, and we can put the mic in there instead of trying to stick something to you. Especially during the summertime when people are jogging and things like that, it makes much more sense to do something like that. Gotcha. Um, the other thing that's very important is once you're wired, try not to do anything. Don't do jumping jacks. We have some method actors that want to be out of breath. And so they, and by the time they do all of that stuff, the mic's dropped or whatever. So you want to try and, and be aware of it, but not so much that it's going to impede your performance. But once your scene is done, come back to the sound cart so we can remove your mic and transmitter. Otherwise, we had an actor, it was right before Thanksgiving, it was the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, and as soon as we, uh, as soon as he was wrapped, he took off, he, he drove his car in a uh, cast wardrobe to the airport, and he was trying to board a plane, but they caught his microphone on him, his transmitter on him. So, but you know, we use these transmitters on other actors throughout the day. So, but we sanitize them and we do all sorts of stuff. We take measures, but we do. And um, when, you, um, when you come back from lunch and you've left your microphone and transmitter in the trailer, 
or when you leave set and you take your microphone and transmitter with you, that uh, that keeps us from doing our jobs. So yeah. And that's something that I think is just an overall very important theme for actors to understand is uh, that collaboration, not just with the other actor in the scene. I think a lot of actors will default to that thought when they hear collaboration. Oh, it's, oh, it's me and the other actor and maybe the director, but that it truly is a collaboration with the sound department, with hair, makeup, wardrobe, um, all those departments. And now a green actor can get frozen by all of that. Um, so let's kind of maybe move to that on set experience of now uh, the rehearsal's been done, the actor's been wired um, with a wireless mic. Um, have they been uh, asked to come to set and we're now getting ready to roll? What are some of the things that start to stand out to you um, that an actor, whether or not they're green or veteran, can do to either make your job harder um, or they're the actor that you thank at the end of the day because they had, they've done nothing to, to impede your, your job? Make sure that the uh, other departments don't take shortcuts. Make sure that sound gets their turn to have their chance to, to work on you and wire you up. And then when you're on set, the director will always be like, oh, come on, let's shoot the rehearsal. The talent has been away getting into costume, hair and makeup. And the second team, the stand-ins, have been going through the motions on set. So the camera operators, everybody has been rehearsing slightly um, uh, with the second team, with the stand-ins. And then the director says, oh, come on, let's shoot the rehearsal. Well, shooting the rehearsal does nobody any good. There's hardly ever a time where the magic happens where you're shooting the rehearsal because... Um, Normally, inevitably, there's going to be a boom in the shot because the camera's not going to be moving the same place because the actors have not been working with the camera operators. The actors have been away. So I would encourage all the actors to not want to shoot the rehearsal because the rehearsal helps everybody else get into sync with the, the realies as opposed to the stand-ins. To be clear, if you are a new actor or if you're number 57 on the call sheet, don't ask Martin Scorsese to not shoot the rehearsal. In those types of situations, trust that the director knows what they are doing. But if you have a bigger role, a recurring role, or maybe you're the only actor in the scene that day, perhaps that might be the time to speak up and let your voice be heard in regards to what Aaron is talking about. And the actors have only run through it once with the blocking the yeah. way that they have. Yeah. So they're probably not going to um, do the same thing that the stand-ins have been studying for like uh, 45 minutes. So and I, there's been many times where I've come back to set and my mark is in a different place. And, exactly. and a good stand-in uh, who ha hasn't fallen asleep um, will, will then avail me of that change. Like, oh, hey, by the way, they want you now to hit this mark instead of that mark. And you're like, oh, thank you. And that will then make... The, the next re rehearsal go a little bit smoother. But yeah, there's almost no value at that point in re recording the rehearsal because the actor is is dealing with new blocking, new new uh, marks, maybe even new uh, placement of, of furniture or, or props that have been introduced. And so, yeah, it, 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 I, I can't see it really helping many departments to, to record the rehearsal. There are a lot of changes that are made because camera needs them. So also the rehearsal will help identify any kind of other uh, issues that are happening. For instance, with the sound department, we often encounter friendly fire, is what I call it. It's between dolly noise, camera fans, um, even the the charging station for all of the uh, the camera batteries that has a fan on it that makes a lot of whiny noises. And then there's uh, other things like squeaky doors air conditioning units or heaters or whatever. There's there's all sorts of things that once everybody is quiet, you'll start to hear all of these things. And you really don't want to uh, film with all of these things going on and not being able to identify them. Because what we do is we let... We don't want to turn off the AC while we're setting up and make everybody suffer. Because if the actor feels comfortable, they're not going to be sweating and uh, 
unable to uh, remember their lines. They're going to be concentrating on trying to get cool. So, yeah, it's so interesting. It, it almost becomes a paradox where when sound department and other departments, when they try to, to kind of interfere as little as possible and to make the actor as comfortable as possible, it 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 serves the purpose of letting the actor think about their craft and think about their character and think about the needs of, of the, the scene. But then paradoxically, it can also make them forget some of those needs that will make your job easier. So for instance, you mentioned uh, some of those incidental noises that are, that are not intended to happen uh, as practical noises, much rather it be added later as, as Foley or, or, or part of that sound design. Yes. Okay, so I want to condense my next question because I babbled for a while. Essentially, I was talking about you're filming a scene and you sense that a door is about to close or there's a noisy prop about to be set down. And as the actor who has the dialogue, organically stopping yourself between lines to allow for that noise to happen and then organically picking it back up. And if you can do that seamlessly, is that of help to the sound department? And spoiler alert, it is. Yeah, absolutely. You should try and work around those noises. Um, we ask that actors, when they're coming into the room, that they not deliver their line over a door closing. If they're closing the door, close the door, then deliver your line. If you're putting dishes away, put a dish away, deliver a line of dialogue, put a dish away, deliver a line of dialogue. And be careful about uh, uh, stepping over your co-actors dialogue as well. You don't want to put a dish away while your other actors uh, delivering a line of dialogue. Also, we have props. Props, okay? We had a scene that was out in downtown Atlanta and we had two girls and they were walking down the street. They were having a conversation and one of them had a a uh, bag of popcorn. Now, bear in mind, this is a wide shot, so it's it's got to be on the wireless mics, right? But she's, and bear in mind where the wireless mic is. It's right here. So the only thing we're hearing is the bag of popcorn. So you've got to be really careful and be well aware, you know, and, and this is part of your job is you've got to be well aware of what's going on. So like you can deliver a line of dialogue. Deliver line of dialogue. But otherwise, this is all going to get redone. So I'm on a quest right now for more silent props. Mm. Uh, I did a movie that you were in uh, two years ago called Reptile. We had a scene with a poker table, a poker game that was going on. And uh, the props department supplied cards poker chips. So here's the issue. Many of the actors in the scene, when they're getting ready to, to do the scene, they're fidgeting with their poker chips over dialogue. And so, so I'm on a quest to try and get more quiet props, more like poker chips that are quiet so that an actor can feel like they can fidget with the chips without it interfering with the dialogue. I mean, we managed to get the scene done, but I would much rather not have to remind the first AD and the director and the actors to not fidget with their poker chips. Instead, let them do what they want so everything's organic. But, you know, that's another thing is that if you have props or if, you, if you're in a scene, try not to fidget especially don't fidget over somebody else's dialogue. You know, if you're sitting there in a chair, you know, you don't want to, because we hear that, you know, we hear all of it. Yeah. Especially if they have uh, noisy clothing or heels on a, on a hard floor and they're, they're tap, tap, tapping. We've had leather jackets that have made all sorts of noise. I might have a solution for that. You know, it is really fascinating to see uh, all those solutions that have that have been born out of necessity, essentially. Any dining scenes in a in a restaurant or a dining room, you know, it's like the the background people. They're often given the matching plates and flatware that that the hero table has. And the problem is, is that you know they're metal on ceramic, and it's just, yeah, you know, that drives us crazy. I think actors need to be a little bit more. Um, willing to ask questions of like, well, what's going to be seen? Because if I was, because somebody might be like, well, I was eating the popcorn in the wide. 
But if I'm not going to, but if I'm not going to see the bag in this medium close-up shot, and you didn't like pull the bag up to your mouth, right. then it's like okay, well then just put a few pieces of popcorn on a plate or in your hand, right. so that now we can take the bag noise out of this medium shot. And I think a lot of actors are too um, too nervous to ask those questions, or just don't think to ask those types of questions that might then take this this variable out of the equation. And yes, we're still going to get maybe the crunching that needs to be timed right of when they they bite down on the popcorn, but at least we've taken out the the most egregious. See, I th think one of the things, as I was mentioning about reptile, it's like uh, the issue is, is that the props department gets a list of all the props they need for the scene. And they'll check this stuff off their list. Now, the, the issue becomes, look, you know, you fulfilled your, your obligation of having this prop here. The, the issue becomes, is this prop going to be friendly to the other departments? Like, if you get a prop that's um, like some sort of mirror ball type of thing, is that going to be conducive to the camera department? And it's the same thing with sound, you know. So we, uh, I work hand in hand with the props departments on a lot of these shows. I've been at wardrobe fittings where they're they're putting something on me, and they're like, oh, "Sound is going to hate this." Yeah. And sometimes they say it with sympathy in their voice, and sometimes they say it with like, "Oh well, this is what the director wants, or this is what we like, or this is what's uh, you know accurate for the time period." And and I so I've ex, I've experienced that range of I will do whatever the director wants, but I make sure that the director knows before we do it that this is what it's going to do. So we had a situation on one of these TV shows I'd worked on in the past, where the actress was wearing some large hoop earrings, but she was also wearing a big choker necklace. And every time she turned her head, the hoop earrings would hit the choker necklace. And it was subtle enough that you really didn't hear it unless you were listening to her wireless mic or the boom because we pick up everything. So it was like, you know, a bell ringing or chimes, wind chimes. So after the director got into the edit suite and heard this, he sent a memo down to the costuming department that that combination was never to happen again. So that's good. Um, any other uh, sort of uh, tips or, or, or red flags for actors to watch out for in terms of um, how they can make your job easier on set? Make sure that their coverage is coverage and not a wide and tight. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said before, the wide is for the dialogue, to capture the dialogue. But the, the coverage is for the boom to capture your performance. So try and uh, if you have any kind of say, you know, say, oh, oh, we're doing my coverage. Well, let's make sure that that camera has like a, a complimentary shot and not something that's wide. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're number 72 on the call sheet, you probably won't feel empowered to speak up in this type of situation. But if you are high on the call sheet or it's an independent production and you sense that everyone is kind of learning as they go, then use this knowledge to your advantage. So if you are in that scene and they've set up a camera wide to capture the whole scene and they're also doing your close up at the same time, Maybe just raise your hand on behalf of that sound department and ask the question. You don't have to say it in an accusatory manner. Just get curious while you're there on set because you may end up doing that sound person, that whole sound department, a solid by vocalizing the very thing they feel like they can't vocalize in that moment. But again, trust your own judgment as to whether or not it's appropriate to even bring this up in that environment that you find yourself in. Most situations, especially if, if the mixer's any good, you want those performances on the boom. Oh, and one other thing that I need to mention that's very important. Veterans uh, often do this for us. Deliver your performance the same way you did in rehearsal. If you change your performance, like if you're going to whisper, let us know. But especially if you're going to whisper in the next take, but you're going to scream in the take after that, let us know that too. I've had situations where a performer has whispered during the scene, and then we've gone again, and I've 
I had all my volumes up, all the games games up to capture the whisper, and they've screamed the, the, the line the next time. You know, just give us some advance warning. Is it enough to just whisper that into my into my lav or, or into my wireless, or should I actually uh, t turn to the boom operator? Turn to the boom operator and say, hey, you know, this time I'm going to yell. Gotcha. Um, we had a situation. I was working on Thor Ragnarok, and there's a scene where they're in um, the Sanctorum or whatever it is, the um, Doctor Strange's Sanctorum, and Loki comes falling out of the atmosphere and he lands on the ground. Uh, well, we did several takes of that where Tom Hiddleston delivers his line, I've been falling for 30 minutes. And it's just, he's kind of mumbling it or whatever. And the last time he did it, he's he shouts it, I've been falling for 30 minutes. And we, fortunately, we were far enough away from him that we were able to capture all of them with equal amount. And that was the one that they used, the one with him screaming, so. I have been falling for 30 minutes. Is it a source of pride when, when you find out, or maybe you don't find out if uh, X percent of an episode that you ran sound on uh, did not need to be uh, ADR? Well, most of the stuff that I do now um, is... I think I've got a 98% rate of, of actual dialogue that, that's kept. Greg uh, Crawford, who does most of the ADR in town, he says, uh, you know, there's no way you're going to keep me in business. So we were in his neighborhood one time. He says, I think I'm going to come over there with a leaf blower. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. Um Oh, one last question then about that uh, sort of um, uh, what might contribute to having to ADR later or just headaches on set. Um, having come from theater or anybody who's vocally trained, they will not only have theoretically a, a, a more um, well-developed voice, you know, they might have some better lower, you know, a lower register. They're, they're speaking from their chest as opposed to from their throat. Um, and so if they decide to do like the what I like to call the Hollywood whisper, where they whisper all the dialogue, you know, they can sometimes get away with that because there's still a little bit of gravitas to the voice. There's still something there. Whereas I think some actors might just think, oh, whispering's cool. And then there's just nothing there to support it. Uh, have, is that is that I have I've ex experienced both. And the problem with uh, some Hollywood actors is they get into a who can talk softer contest. I'm not afraid of you. Yeah. Well, you should be. Let's just see how it all shakes out in the meeting. Yeah. Let's. The issue becomes if you're experiencing a lot of friendly fire on set and you know it's stuff that you can't do anything about we ended up on some really noisy stages in the past or it's in the middle of the summer and they're trying to run the ac as quietly as possible which is kind of not possible yeah <laughs> but you've got to speak up and you've got to make sure that your voice uh moves above is heard above the din of the room and um, or situations where they're in a, a nightclub environment and they're speaking in normal voices. And we tell them, look, you know, you're in a nightclub. You're going to have to speak up like it's like you're in a nightclub and you're going to shout over people. You're going to use your outside voice, even though you're in a, a nightclub environment, because sometimes you're not going to be believable if you're normal voice. Yeah. But I, I think the most important thing is is there on a hundred person crew on the back of the call sheet, 97 of them are working towards picture. Three of them are working towards sound. So it's important for the actors to make sure that, that their dialogue is preserved and that make sure that their performance is preserved. If you hear noises, you just assume that we're going to hear them too and, and ask us questions because we're more than happy to answer questions and we're more than happy to come up with solutions for you so that you, you're not going to have to go into the control room uh, uh, in the sound stage or whatever to, to record your voiceovers or record your dialogue. I know there are some actors that will intentionally uh, 
screw it up so that they can go in and do it better in ADR. I heard a rumor that that's what Brando would do. That's what he would mumble on set intentionally so that he knew he could go back and perfect his performance later. But uh, I know coming from a sound background, I, I always place more value on sound. And, and it's one of the things here in our studio when people tape auditions that uh, they they say they look so good. And it's like, you know, the lights are not anything fancy here. And you know, we're just pointing them at the actor. It's, and our camera is not that great, you know. <laughs> There are people using much more expensive cameras at other taping services. And I think what, what psychologically is happening is because they sound better here than perhaps at their home studio or, or right. maybe somewhere else, uh, they don't understand. Like it, to me, it's why I started this way. It's like the least understood department on set. It has such an overwhelming effect on the final product. Like you said, 97 of those 100 people are working towards picture, three towards sound, and yet... That balance in the final product is is not 97 to 3. It's <laughs> Look at the movie Clerks, okay? Kevin Smith. The uh, uh, Miramax. Love the movie so much. The dialogue was, was the, the written dialogue was so good. But it sounded horrible. It, even in the uh, credits, Scott Mosher was the mixer. The boom operator was listed as anybody who held the stick. That's literally in the credits. The dialogue was so bad, the sound was so bad that Miramax spent an extra 40 grand on redoing the dialogue because they knew the audience would forgive a bad picture, but they would never forgive bad sound. Yeah. So it, it's the same thing. I did a low budget movie with Alex Motlaw and Pop Films back in 2005. It's called The Signal. Originally, it was supposed to go direct to DVD and it was supposed to be fundraising for a movie. But, you know, I still had a boom operator and we still took very good care of get, capturing really good sound for the movie. So it uh, premiered at Sundance and um, during the first 20 minutes of the movie or whatever, the auditorium, all these people started leaving the auditorium and the first director, Dave Bruckner, was like, oh, my God, they hate the movie. And so one of the people from Pop Films went out into the lobby. It was all of the representatives of the studios calling to see how much they could bid on the signal. So a movie that was budgeted at like 50 grand, including uh, Lab 601 doing all the post, sold to Magnolia Pictures for $2.3 million. And it was mostly uh, original sound captured by me and my boom operator. So uh, and the point is, is that it's more important that it sound good than it is that it look good. I mean, there's some glaring things like, you know, breaking the 180 line and, you know, boom shadows and things like that and just shooting into the sun. If your movie sounds good, it won't sound like it's an independent project. Once you start tuning into it, you'll start to be able to pick it out as, oh, that is the limiting factor. That is the thing that is distracting me or that is the thing that is making this look uh, amateur or independent. One of the telltale signs of an independent movie is you got two people at a diner sitting in a booth and it just sounds awkward. It's because they're not booming the actors, they're booming the table. <laughs> and you hear, you don't hear the actors' voices, you hear the reflection of the table on uh, coming up to the boom. Yeah. So, well, um, I, yeah, I think that. In summary, it, it's uh, as this relates back to actors and, and whether it's you're producing your own work, you're on set, you're getting wired up. Um, it's just to have a little bit more of that sensitivity towards that sound department and to ask questions. I think that that's that's probably another theme of this because the more we can help each other, uh, the different departments, the the better product it results. Um, so thank you, Aaron, for being here. Well, thank you. So I hope that interview was as informative for you as it was for me, having had 20 plus years of experience in this business. My thanks again to Aaron for giving up his time for this invaluable information. Of course, we didn't cover everything. So if you have additional questions or comments, please drop them below. If I can't answer them, then I'll reach out to Aaron and get the answer for you. That's it for now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on set.